Can you tell me if you can hear me, please? You can hear me? Yeah. And you can see my screen? To both. Is it loud in my background? It doesn't appear to be or okay. here that way. Okay. We're going to give people a few more minutes to join. So we'll start here in just a couple of minutes. Also, everybody, I just shared a uh, uh, link to the slides in the chat. So if you want to uh, follow along on your computers, there's that available as well. Thank you for joining us. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started and people can join as they come on and um, catch on then.
Uh, you'll have to excuse us. Um, we have a band in the uh, outside, so it might be loud in my um, microphone, but please let me know if it's an issue. So everyone, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join the board's Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Amy Habe, and I am the Compliance Officer here with the Board of Engineers and Architects. Joining me today is Josh Berkin, and he is the Board's Public Information Officer, and then also John Wilbeck, who is the Board's Executive Director. So before we get started, I wanted to let everybody know that the webinar is being recorded and will be um, uploaded to the Board's YouTube channel later this week or early next week. So if you're unable to stay for the whole presentation or want to reference it later or pass it along, that's where it will be available. Um, the slides and templates that we also go over today will be available as well if you would like any of those copies. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, but if you have a question about a specific slide that we're reviewing, feel free to type that into the chat box. Um, that everybody is muted, so the chat box is really the only way to communicate during the webinar. In the end, obviously, if you have questions, we will have um, email and phone call and stuff that you can do to ask any follow up questions. Um, for those who participate for the entire presentation, an email will be sent to you next week confirming your attendance and the possible use for continuing education credits. Um, we do anticipate that the board um, would give credits for this webinar, but as a reminder, the board does not pre-approve any CE offerings. So with that said, let's get started. Um, today, we're gonna be going over a guide to remediation and kind of the remediation process in general. So we're going to briefly talk about when licensees are required to design projects or be involved in that process. Um, then we'll discuss the enforcement process for when projects that are not in compliance with the ENA Act and what remediation looks like for those project owners and the remediation licensees. Um, we'll discuss the remediation licensee list and then lastly have time for questions and answers that you may have. So first we're gonna go over when licensees are required. Go back real quick. Um, so as a reminder, the Board of Engineers and Architects purpose is to govern the practice of engineering architecture in the state of Nebraska and in, or, in order to protect life, health, property, and pr promote public welfare. So licensees are required on a project when the work comprises the practice of architecture or engineering, and the work is not exempt from the Engineers and Architects Regulation Act. Here are the definitions of engineering and architecture. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but engineering is any service or creative work that requires engineering education, training and experience in the application of special knowledge of the mathematical, physical and engineering sciences. Architecture is providing or offering to provide design services in connection with the construction, enlargement or alteration of a building or group of buildings in the space within the surrounding buildings. So if a project constitute the, constitutes the practice of engineering or architecture, you move to the next step to determining if the project falls under any exemptions. Rule 10.3 is probably the most used and clear exemption matrix that we have. So um, it, it outlines when projects are exempt based on the occupancy classification and size of the project. So for example, if a project being built is classified as an assembly occupancy and is less than a thousand square feet, design professionals likely will not be required. However, if the project is a thousand square feet or more, um, design professionals would be required. Many structures have more than one occupancy classification. So in this case, any structure which contains two or more occupancies is governed by the most restrictive occupancy. 
Meaning if you have a building that has a business occupancy and assembly occupancy, the maximum building area for a business occupancy is 3,000 square feet and assembly is 1,000. Since assembly is the most restrictive, that entire project is now considered an assembly occupancy. And if it's greater than 1,000 square feet, design professionals would be required for the project. Renovations and one level additions um, to an existing building are exempt if the total impacted area is less than the area set by rule 10.3, that chart that we just went over. And the area of renovation or addition does not adversely impact the mechanical, electrical systems, structural integrity, means of egress, and does not change or come into conflict with the occupancy classification of the existing or adjacent tenant space building structure or work. So if the renovation or addition adversely impacts other areas, these additional areas shall be included in the occupancy and building area calculations set forth in that last chart in 10.3. Public works are also exempt um, from requiring licensees if they do, if they're exempt if they're less than $118,000. So this is the only um, time you will find a dollar amount attached to a project, but public works projects um, are thought of as structures that cannot be measured in square footage. So dams, bridges, roads, structures of that nature. This dollar amount, the 118,000, is adjusted every five years, and the next adjustment will be um, next year, July 1 of 2024. That information is typically posted to our website um, and in, anywhere else the board has communication, so you might wanna check back at that time. Farm buildings, so the construction, remodeling, alteration, or renovation of a farm building, including barns, silo sheds, or housing for farm equipment and machinery, livestock, poultry, or storage, um, if the, they're exempt if they're designed to be occupied by more than 20 persons. So the board went a little further in clarifying farm buildings, um, and that farm buildings shall be defined as an agricultural building as defined in the state building code. The way that reads is a structure designed and construct constructed to house farm implements, hay, grain, poultry, livestock, or other horticultural products. So this does not mean that humans are living in there or um, inhabiting the space or anything like that. So this is specifically for farm animals and machinery storage. Building officials, building officials can also be more strict than the ENA Act. So even though um, a building may not be required to have design, oops, design professionals per 10.3 or other rules, building officials can require those um, design professionals to be involved if they find a hazard to the life health safety due to unusual circumstances of a building or if there's an, an unusually large number of potential occupants in relation to the square footage for a particular occupancy. So state law is the minimum requirement, but local officials can be more strict. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about projects that were designed without licensees and how to bring those projects into compliance with the act to protect the life, health, and safety of the public. So all that we're gonna review here is in chapter eight of the ENA Act. Um, and you can reference that too from our handbook or our website. So the board receives complaints and notifications from various entities. Um, anyone can file a complaint with the board related to a building, renovation, or addition project. Um, we typically see complaints from members of the public, professionals in the building industry, state agencies, professional organizations and societies, local jurisdictions and officials, state fire marshal, things like that. So a copy of our complaint form can be found on our website. Um, the first page of the complaint form is shown here. 
all information, identifying information um, of the submitting party does remain confidential. So if a complaint is submitted to the board and you're concerned that it's going to, your information will be released to whom you're making the complaint about, that information is all confidential and will not be shared with anybody besides the board, obviously. So the tip complaint form asks just for some information of the project, any um, supporting documentation, things like that, that you may have and how it violates the Engineers and Architects Regulation Act. So once a complaint is received regarding a project with inadequately sealed documents, the investigation really begins to determine if there is an issue that may constitute a violation of the act. So the investigation typically includes board staff reaching out to the owner, the builder, or other entities that are involved in the project, just to gather more information on the project. So we send a typical, typically we send a, general letter about what asking what's being done, who's involved, what changes are being made, copies of plans, size, things like that. So once all of that information is received, um, then the information is presented to the board to determine if there is a violation or if there's probable cause for a violation of the act. Um, backing up just a second, during the investigation process, sometimes site visits are completed to the projects. Um, that Those site visits are not to come critique or anything like that. It's really just to gather more information for the board, take pictures, um, just to give the board the biggest picture possible of what's going on with that project. So once all that information is compiled, it's presented to the board, like I said, to determine if the project is in violation of the act. If there is a violation, the board then determines if formal or informal action needs to be taken. Typically what happens with projects like this that don't involve the design professionals as required, the board will typically, like I said, authorize architecture and or engineering remediation to bring that project into compliance. So rule 8.1 kind of goes over just that process, that investigation, investigative process that I just went over. So if the board authorizes, finds that there's a violation of the act and authorizes that remediation, rule 8.4 outlines what remediation should look like for all of these projects. We are in the process of adding some additional um, rules to this, but this is the current rules in place. And I can kind of add in um, just the minor changes that are happening. But remediation involves the engagement of an architect and or professional engineer to review a project and bring that project into compliance with the Engineers and Architects Reg Regulation Act. Um, so these projects, like I said, can be remediated under the following um, circumstances per Rule 8.4. So if the board authorizes engineering and architecture remediation, that project owner must involve a professional engineer and an architect to review the project and assist with bringing this project into compliance. Um, so if the, there's a lot of confusion at times when we say and or engineer, engineering and or architecture, that's not a choice. If the board decides and authorizes engineering, remedi engineering and architectural remediation, both of those design professionals have to be involved in that project. It's not, again, you don't get to choose if you just want a professional engineer or an architect involved. Both must be involved. But if the board authorizes engineering remediation, then that architectural remediation is not required then. And same with architecture. So once the remediation licensees have been engaged, the rule 8.4 requires that they submit a letter to their board bearing their seal explaining their relationship to the project and identifying any deficiencies if they exist. 
if the project is under construction, the remediation architect and or professional engineer must identify immediate concerns of public safety and when required, notify the appropriate authority to halt construction. So if a remediation licensee comes in and deems that this project is an immediate threat to the life health safety of the public, they have to notify the appropriate authorities. If deficiencies are identified, the remediation architect, the remediation licensees must recommend design solutions to correct those deficiencies. So that is required in your letter to, um, to the owner so they know what they have to do to fix and remediate those deficiencies. The letter will become a permanent part of the existing contract documents. Any revisions made need to be sealed and um, submitted accordingly. Um, they must, the engineer, the remediation licensees must assume responsibility for the design and a coordinating professional must be designated if required. And we'll go over the coordinating, more of the coordinating professionals in the next slide, but those remediation licensees must assume responsibility for that design. New documents prepared by the licensed and professional, licensed professionals must be sealed, signed, and dated accordingly. Uh, and then those licensees shall not seal any of the unsealed or improperly sealed documents with the respect to the project. So one thing that's not added in these rules that the board is looking at um, putting in place is that the requirement for a final letter once those deficiencies have been removed. So again, the owner is required to correct any deficiencies that those remediation licensees identify. Once those deficiencies have been removed, those the remediation licensees need to go back, review the project, and ensure those deficiencies have been appropriately removed, send a letter to the board with that information, and sealed, signed, and dated. So your that remediation licensee is stating the project is now in compliance, and that is the licensee's verification of that. As I stated earlier, coordinating professional, if there is more than one licensee, a coordinating professional for the project is required. So if it, um, again, multiple licensees are involved, the coordinating professional should be identified and designated in the remediation letter and appear on the cover sheet of any newly produced technical documents. So again, anybody looking at the project's documents should know who's kind of overseeing the projects, who's involved in all of that contact information. The board recently developed some um, example remediation letters. We did have, we do work with multiple licensees. And so the board kind of compiled this letter um, just to show what a good letter should look like or ideally would look like. Um, so, as you can see with this template, we have who's involved at the top, what complaint it is, all the project information. And then in the body of the letter, it goes back to rule 8.4 and what's required in those letters. So, first paragraph saying who the project owner is, who's involved, um, and then just information about that. What did they review? What did they find? Um, what was their whole process of really that reviewing that project? So as you can see on the bottom of the page, um, one primary code deficiency. So that starts kind of the, the list of deficiencies that they found for this project. And this is their page two or the page two and it identifies again, what is that deficiency? And what are the ways that they can correct that deficiency in order to bring this project into compliance? Their recommendations are at the end, and then they sign or seal, sign, and date that letter. And this is a template that I had referenced in the beginning that if individuals would like to see copies of this, these um, templates will be available. Obviously, don't copy and paste, but fill in accordingly. <laughs> 
Here is a template of the final remediation letter. So again, it doesn't have to be as detailed as the first one. This is obviously same kind of format, but they have stating that they have reviewed the project um, with the owner. This is what they chose to do to remediate those deficiencies. And now the project is in compliance. Seal, sign, date. And then going back real quick to this um, first remediation letter, if it is, if the licensee feels that new plans need to be produced in order to, you know, give the best information possible to, you know, remediate these deficiencies, that is their decision. And those would be attached here to this letter. The board does not require that new plans have to be produced. Um, it is really up to the licensee and that project owner. Okay, so the remediation licensee list. This list is voluntary. Um, the volunteers must be in good standing with the board. So we're not going to put licensees that maybe have lots of disciplinary action or uh, not up to date with their license or you know certificate of authorization, things of that nature. This license or this list that is being sent to owners is showing that, hey, these volunteers are in good standing with the board and they're familiar with the remediation process. So like I said, when requested, we don't automatically send it out to anybody and everybody. When this list is requested, it's sent to those project owners to connect them with licensees that are willing to assist with the remediation process and are familiar with this remediation process. Um, it, it, you know, coming, having a project that nine times out of 10, the projects that come to the board are because people just didn't know that licensees were required. So anything we can really do to help those project owners ease, you know, into this process and give them support is what the board is really trying to do to get the projects into compliance. So this list is one resource that um, the board has developed to kind of assist, like I said, those project owners into giving a little bit more support because there's lots of licensees out there. They don't know who to choose. They don't know what to do. Um, and so again, just a tool that the board developed. So to join the list, we will be sending out a post webinar survey um, that will ask for that information. So after you guys see the webinar, if you decide that this is something that you would like to put yourself as an individual licensee or as an organization on the list, fill out that webinar, post webinar survey um, with the information, provide your name and license number. And then again, if it is going to be an organization, provide that name and certificate of authorization number. So that is all I have. Um, we will go over questions here in just a second. Um, there is some contact information and resources listed here. Um, the board did produce a guide to remediation that we do have brochures of. It goes through rule 8.4, frequently asked questions for project owners and licensees. Um, so this is good information. If you choose to be on a remediation licensee list, we will be sending you copies of this um, to have in your office and distribute accordingly. Um, so if you need more remediation brochures, physical copies, handbooks, things of that nature, the uh, marketing email is there. Josh will get you that information as requested. Um, if you have questions about the remediation, licensee list, or anything else compliance related, you can send an email to that compliance email as well. Does anybody have any questions? Amy, this is uh, John Wilbeck here. Um, so there have been a couple questions that have come up on the chat. Um, first of all, uh, design professionals that are involved in the remediation projects, does each of the design professionals involved need to send a letter to the board as part of their um, work in the remediation process? Yes, each, um, each remediation licensee needs to produce their own letter 
um, identifying. If you combine them together and send them all as one document, that's perfectly fine. But if you're an engineer reviewing the engineering and the architect is reviewing the architecture, you, each licensee needs to produce their own letter because they're going to seal that letter stating they've done the work. Uh, another question that came in, uh, can a design professional just review the plans that have already been prepared, non-compliant plans, or do they actually need to go out and walk the site? Um, what do you think the board is looking for in those cases? I think the board is looking for whatever needs done to ensure that you are reviewing the project appropriately. Uh, if you have enough information based on the plans, pictures, communication, um, a, a site walkthrough may not be required, um, but whatever it is, at the end of the day, it's your seal that you're putting on this letter saying this project's in compliance and recommending design correction. So if that is, like I said, that you need to go out and do a site visit because you're not 100% sure, probably should do that. Okay. Um, about how many projects does the board um, uh, authorize remediation for every year, ballpark? Um, we authorize remediation for in the last, I would say, three years, we're probably around 40 projects, 30 to 40 projects a year. So that's a fair amount. Yeah, very much so. Okay. And a lot, um, like I said before, a lot of it, is, or nine times out of 10, it's because people just didn't know they needed to involve those design professionals. So, right. I mean, right. we do get those that try to sneak on by, but um, yeah. Um, another question, I think I'll take this one. Um, has reme remediation design responsibility ever been tested in law? Um, not uh, that I'm aware of, although we have, um, we have come up against some project owners who are resistant even to the remediation process. You know, they'll, they'll come in and say, you know, I'm just building a, you know, a bar in my hometown, what do I need architects or engineers for? Um, and in some cases, the board has actually um, taken those owners um, to an administrative hearing, which is a, um, you know, a quasi judicial hearing that the board has. And we have an attorney general representative who acts as our counsel in those. Um, and so, but as far as the point about remediation design responsibility, I don't think that has, we don't have any precedent for that. Um, so there's that. Um, another question is, are state and local fire marshals aware of the requirements for involving architects and engineers? Um, I can say, at least as far as the state fire marshal goes, we have a really good relationship um, with Doug Hobine and all those folks over there at the state fire marshal. So, we are continually giving feedback um, to his office uh, about when architects and engineers are required. And uh, to be clear, a lot of the things we hear from project owners are, you know, well, I got the state farm marshal approval. What's what's this ENA? Why do I need the ENA board's approval for it? Well, what the state farm marshal does and what the board does are two completely separate things. The state farm marshal enforces their NFPA and everything else that they do. And the board is simply here to enforce the ENA Act, which says uh, on certain types of projects of certain size and complexity, architects and engineers are required. So yes, I understand that this has created some confusion for owners. And we hear that uh, oftentimes when, they're, when they first get that letter from Amy and the board. And so one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to take more education tack, like how do we, you know, work with local building officials to help get the word out about what the ENA Act says and what the board's mission is to enforce the act. And so we're trying our best to get that done. Yeah, and to piggyback off that too, um, we the state fire marshal has added some sentences on their code reviews. Um, which has helped tremendously in those sentences stating that plans do not bear this plans that do not bear the seal of a professional engineer or a licensed architect um, may be subject to the Board of Engineers and Architects. 
and then provides the contact information. So over the last couple of years, that actually has been very helpful to um, those project owners who aren't familiar with the whole process. But like John said, we do work very closely with the fire marshal's office because obviously they see a lot of projects that come through as well. So. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, uh, one is, what entity is responsible for the final review of the remediated building? Is it the state fire marshal? Um, this is the case of the project is outside of a larger community that, that does not have a building official. Again, I think that's really up to the juris, you know, the location and the jurisdictions that have authority uh, in that locale. Um, there, you're right. There are some locations that don't have building officials. Um, despite that, the ENA Act still applies to every corner of the state. So, at least the project, um, if it's over those thresholds in Rule 10.3, they have to involve uh, architects or PEs as necessary um, to get to uh, design and oversee construction of that project. Uh, another question is remediation only for non compliant projects. Um, or does it also address those licensees who are not responsive to their owners? They have a licensed professional with a history of not responding to owners when they have questions during plan review. Well, remediation is really, it, it's really for projects is to get a project that is um, usable by the public. Um, into compliance with the act. Now, licensees who are not responsive to their owners, that's a whole different ball of wax. Um, that could be a concern. I'm thinking of Chapter 5 in the Code of Conduct, you know, that uh, licensees must, must act with reasonable care. Um, I can't remember exactly what it says, but um, there could be a potential there um, for uh, Code of Conduct violations. So if you have, um, if you want to chat with me, Privately over the phone about that. Um, be happy to just talk through that with you. Any other questions? Doesn't appear so. So Josh has some stuff to say though before um, we yeah. hang up here. Well, yeah, everybody, thank you so much for joining. Um, again, feel free to reach out to us on these uh, emails here, marketing and uh, our compliance email for uh, any questions or if you want to get some of these copies of remediation guides or uh, some of those templates, um, definitely reach out because they, they're free and, and the state will mail them to you. <laughs> um, some other things from us. Um, as far as claiming credit for this uh, CE session, if you're joining by phone, please send me an email with the phone number that you used and whatever email address you want that verification to go to. It just helps speeds up the process. Um, if your colleagues are in the same room as you and you're all sharing the same account, you know, put this up on a, on a TV or something like that, please um, send me an email with all those in attendance. That way everyone can get those, um, those credits as well. Uh, another note, WebEx usually takes a few days to generate an attendance report, so it won't be until early next week till we get the, those verification emails out. Um, some other things, our, our next webinar, uh, date TBD, but uh, we're looking in the fall to discuss the, uh, the CE and the uh, audit cycle and the renewal cycle, so stay tuned for information on that here in a few months. Uh, and then also look forward to a... Um, an upcoming blog post from the NBA uh, on our website, and we'll, we'll stay in communication with that via email. Uh, I see a, a quick question came in. Uh, there's a there's going to be a post webinar survey that has uh, some forms to fill out if you are interested in becoming uh, a volunteer for that remediation list. So stay tuned to your email that is coming out this week, um, and that survey will also have uh, additional questions such as if you uh, knew and works or how you learned about us and and all that kind of stuff. So so fill out your information there. And um, I think that's going to be it. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. We'll see you in the fall. Okay. Thanks, care. everyone.